Hello everyone, in this video I will present my paper titled Prioritizing server side Reachability via Inter-Process Concolic Testing and as the name implies I will show a new automated testing technique named Inter-Process Testing which allows us to distinguish between server side errors that are reachable and server side errors that are not reachable in a given client server configuration. Since Inter-Process Testing is a form of Concolic Testing I will start this presentation by giving a quick introduction to concolic testing. Concolic testing is a form of automated testing where the tester iteratively exposes the program from multiple test iterations and reports all errors that it finds. A distinguishing feature of concolic testing is that it attempts to steer the execution of the program towards those parts of the program that have not yet been explored. To make this idea of sticking execution a bit more concrete, I'll show how a concolic tester would test this example JavaScript program. If you look at the code of this program, two things become apparent. The first is that this program corresponds with three different program parts. One part in which an uncaught exception is thrown, and two parts that are fine. The second thing that becomes apparent is the fact that the choice of which of these three parts is selected when the program is executed depends on the values of the variables a and b. a is a random number and b is whatever number that the user entered as input. a and b are non-deterministic variables in the sense that if you execute this program multiple times, their values will probably always be different, as opposed to the variable c, which will always receive the same value. These three parts can be represented in a so-called symbolic execution tree. Of course, for non trivial applications, this tree will be much more complicated, and the tester also does not know in advance what the structure of the tree will be. It can only generate this symbolic execution tree by systematically and iteratively executing the program over multiple iterations. So how does the tester generate this symbolic execution tree? In the very first test iteration, the tester just executes the program, and whenever it defines a non-deterministic variable, it just assigns a random value, such as with these two random values for the variables a and b. While the program is being executed, the tester collects symbolic representations of all the conditions that cause the execution to follow this particular path. In these symbolic conditions, the deterministic variables are inlined, so the conditions can be expressed just in function of the non-deterministic variables. This symbolic representation is called the path constraint. In the second iteration, the tester uses the path constraint from the first iteration to find a new path that it can explore. In this case, the tester inverses the condition, uses it as a t-solver to compute a value for a, so that the inverse condition is true, and re-executes the program. While defining a, the tester overrides the call to random int in order to assign the value 101, to A so that the selected part is automatically executed. The tester executes the program, collects the path constraints, reports the error and moves on to the third iteration. In the third iteration, the tester again inverses the path constraints and finds appropriate values for A and B so that the inverse path constraint is satisfied. After re-executing the program, the tester does not find any new paths to explore and terminates. I will now present our new inter-process testing technique and show how it differs from traditional intra-process techniques. Inter-process testing targets full-stack web applications, so I will start by explaining the difference between traditional and full-stack web applications. Traditional web applications consist of a client and a server. The client would almost always be written in a language like JavaScript, the server in a language like PHP, and both sides would communicate with each other via the HTTP protocol. In full stack applications, on the other hand, the server would also be written in JavaScript, and in most cases, developers would, for example, choose Node.js to implement the server sites. Communication can happen via web sockets, so that developers can again rely on JavaScript libraries such as Socket.io. I'll use this example of a full stack online web calculator to demonstrate the differences between traditional intra process testing techniques and a new inter process technique. In this example, users can use a client to press buttons in order to form arithmetic expressions. When the user presses the button labeled with the equality sign, the expression is sent over to the server, server computes the result, and it sends the result back to the client. Here you can see part of the server side code of this application. The highlighted part specifically represents the message handler which receives the arithmetic expression and computes the results. There are two errors that might be triggered here, a division by zero error, and an error if the expression uses an unknown operator. Here's part of the client side's code of the application. The client checks whether the expression is valid before sending it to the server, and if it finds that the expression is not valid, for example because it uses an unknown operator, 
The expression is not sent and a warning is instead shown to the user. Automated testers for traditional web applications have to test the client and server separately in isolation from each other. If for no other reason it affected their builds using different languages, you can still test the whole system manually of course, but if you're relying on a white box automated testing tool that is capable of inspecting the codes, then both components have to be tested separately. I call this intra-process testing because the tester only observes the exclusion of one component or one process. So if you go back to the server codes, an intra-process tester would have tested the server separately while ignoring the clients. This means that the intra-process tester would have to mock the message handler in order to fully explore the code. This has an important disadvantage because it means that an intra-process tester cannot distinguish between both server errors. The division by zero error is reachable from the clients, but the unknown operator exception is not reachable from this particular client because the client filters out invalid expressions. We would like to mark the division by zero error as a high priority error because an end user can trigger this error just by interacting with the clients. I would like to mark the unknown operator error as a low priority error because although the error may be triggered in theory, it cannot arise in this particular client server configuration. However, an intra process tester cannot make this classification because it has no information about the client. Our new inter process testing technique revolves around testing the program holistically, meaning that the client and server are tested simultaneously. Concretely, this means that if a server only executes a piece of code in response to a message sent by the client, then the tester must excise the client in such a way that the message is actually sent, so the tester can observe the reaction of the server to that message. By combining the information about the client and the server, the tester can contextualize errors and distinguish between high and low priority errors. To explore the concepts and the advantages of inter-process testing, we have developed a new concurrent testing tool named Stackfall. Stackfall operates in two phases, a first phase where it applies intra-process testing to find errors on the server while collecting symbolic path constraints, and a second phase where it applies inter-process testing on the, on the entire application. In the second phase, Stackfall tests the application via the client in order to reach server-side errors that were previously discovered during the first phase. By reaching these errors again, Stackfall can classify these errors as being of high or low priority. To demonstrate both phases, I will switch to a newer running example. Here is the relevant part of the server side code of the example. The code defines two message handlers. In both cases, the data parameter of the handler refers to the actual value or the payload of the message. The first handler is called when the server receives a message of type M1, and if a certain condition involving the payload of the message is true, the handler throws an error. The second handler is called when the server receives a message of type M2, and it also throws an error if the Y field of the message payload equals the value 42. In the first phase, Stackfall uses intra-process testing to test only the server. It will iteratively execute the server-side codes and mock message handles that are registered there. Because Stackfall is a concolic tester, it will collect symbolic path constraints which express under which conditions these errors are triggered. In this example, Stackfall will iteratively mock both message handles and because both message handles are mocked, the data payload that they receive can take any value. This data payload appears as non-deterministic variables in the path constraints. Triggering a specific error is a matter of satisfying the constraints by computing the appropriate value for the non-deterministic variables that appear in that constraint. After a fixed number of iterations, Stackfall proceeds to the inter-process testing phase in which it will attempt to excise the client in such a way that Stackfall reaches server-side errors that were previously discovered during the first phase. In order to do so, Stackfall repeats the following three steps. It iteratively explores the client while again collecting symbolic path constraints in order to find method sense where the client communicates with the server. If a method sent is found, Stackfall matches the current client-side path constraint with a server-side path constraint that leads to an error. If a match is possible, Stackfall replays the test run, but it ensures that an appropriate message payload is chosen in order to re-trigger that particular server side error. This is the relevant part of the client side code of our running example. In the first step, Stackfall iteratively explores the client in order to find a message sense such as these two socket.image where the client communicates with its server. In order to explore the program, Stackfall executes the client side code and mocks any event handler that is registered there, while again collecting symbolic path constraints such as these two. 
These power constraints describe under which conditions method sense arise. Non-deterministic values such as these two random values or this random value again appear as non-deterministic variables in the path constraints. If a method sense is found, Stackfall moves on to the next step. In the second step, Stackfall attempts to match the current client-side constraint that describes how to reach a particular method sense with any server-side constraint that starts from a corresponding method handler and leads to a previously discovered error. To match two constraints, Stackfall concatenates both constraints and inserts a kind of glue constraint in between. These glue constraints associate the actual value or payload of the methods with the non-deterministic variables that were used in the intra-process phase to represent the mocked message payload. If the synthetic constraint is satisfiable, then this means that values can be computed for the non-deterministic variables so that the message sent happens on the client side and this message sent leads to particular error being triggered on the server side. For example, this part constraint, which combines the client side part constraint leading to the message sent of M1, with a server side part constraint starting from the message handler for M1 and leading to a particular error, is satisfiable. So the stack fold proceeds to the final step, where it replaces the test run using the values computed for the client side non deterministic variables. If the error is indeed triggered again, the error is marked as a high priority error. On the other hand, if the part constraint leading to a message sent cannot be matched with any part constraint leading to a server error, as is the case with this constraint for the message sent of M2, then the third step is skipped and Stackfold resumes exploring the clients in order to find more message sends. If inter-process testing ends without Stackfold finding any matches for a particular server error, then that error is classified as a low priority error. For a more complete description of all the mechanisms involved in intra- and inter-process testing, as well as the collection of part constraints, I would like to refer you to our paper. Our paper also includes a precise formal description of these mechanisms, but I will not go into detail on that in this video. For more information on the implementation of Stackfold, I would also like to refer you to our paper, which also features a description of the architecture of Stackfold. I will point out here that Stackfold focuses on full-stack web applications which use Socket.io for communication between client and server, because Socket.io allows for bidirectional communication while being easy for Stackfold to intercept. I will now briefly describe how we evaluated Stackfold. We first collected eight full-stack web applications that were publicly available on the internet. We then created two variants of these applications, where we systematically injected different artificial low and high priority errors into these variants. And after generating a variant, we ran Stackfold and we manually verified the error classification that it produced. And here are the results. The first and third number columns list the total number of respectively high and low priority errors in each variant. And the second and fourth columns list how many of these errors were correctly classified. As we can see, the error classification that Stackfold produces is mostly correct. There are some variants where high priority errors are incorrectly classified, which means that these errors were either not discovered at all during the intra- and inter-process testing phase, or they were only discovered during the intra-process testing phase. There are also two variants where low priority errors are incorrectly classified, but in both cases this was due to Stackfold not finding these errors at all during the intra-process testing phase. These incorrect classifications illustrate the most important limitation to inter-process testing, namely that the classification depends on how well both components are explored. If the server is not sufficiently explored, errors will not be found at all. And if the client is not sufficiently explored, high priority errors will be misclassified as low priority errors. For our future work, we therefore aim to incorporate existing techniques in order to increase test coverage. For example, by using more sophisticated concolic search strategies that specifically target event-driven applications, or by merging program parts in the symbolic execution tree to limit the exponential number of parts that are created, or by generating symbolic summaries that concisely describe how particular errors are triggered. To conclude, I've presented a new inter-process testing technique which is used by our concolic tester Stackfall. I have explained how Stackfall combines intra-process testing of the server with inter-process testing of the entire application in order to classify server errors as high priority or low priority errors. And I have presented an evaluation of this approach which shows promising results. This concludes our presentation. Thank you for your attention and please check out our paper.